Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the second half of uh, this week's lecture, part two, uh, looking at Japan. Japan is a society uh, I have experience with uh, in real life, uh, so uh, I, I'm planning to go back there in a year uh, or so, but uh, this is also a Confucian society, so it, it, at, at its very basis are the principles we talked about uh, with China. Uh, so at, at the very beginning, I would like for you to just watch the uh, first video on the list uh, about a young female pop star in Japan uh, and how she had to uh, be contrite uh, for uh, spending the night with her boyfriend who is uh, a lead singer of a boy band, very popular. Uh, and just take a minute to watch that. Okay, well, uh, uh, we see uh, in this video that she shaved her head. Uh, she's issuing an apology. She's lost face. She, she felt that she's dishonored this group, uh, that she's tarnished the image of the band. And again, I, I bring this up to point out that this is a Confucian society. This is a collectivist society. It's one in which your role within the group is, uh, is very important, much more important than in our society. And so uh, norms have to be uh, stuck to very closely. Um, for example, in Japanese, uh, there is the phrase, the nail that sticks up must be hammered down. This is a phrase that elementary school teachers use. And it basically means uh, if you don't conform, you, you're, uh, uh, it's not going to be good. Right? Uh, conformity is required. Uh, and this is because uh, that scene is harmonious. You know, they, it's a very different mentality from what we're used to. We're used to uh, individual expression, that being a right, that being something that we derive pleasure from, uh, our sense of self. Uh, and uh, in Japan, people get that from uh, their belonging within the group. Uh, and each, each perspective has its advantages and disadvantages, which we'll maybe talk more about as we go through the lecture. All right, so we're going to talk about the rise of a distinctive Japanese civilization. You can see in this picture there is a Japanese samurai uh, with his foot on a fallen uh, Mongol soldier. The first uh, millennium AD, Japanese, Japanese civilization developed a Confucian system of government, very similar to that of the Chinese. You have an emperor, uh, he has absolute authority, uh, you have bureaucrats, etc. Over time, these bureaucrats became warriors. They became the samurai, uh, these kind of professional warriors, military aristocrats, very similar to the knights of medieval Europe. During the Mongol period, the Mongols, the great steppe nomads, broke through the Great Wall. They conquered China. They destroyed much of Persia, Iran and Iraq. They conquered Russia. They conquered all of Central Asia. And uh, uh, naturally, Kublai Khan uh, wanted to extend his empire. He aimed at Japan. Uh, but the Japanese were able to defeat two invasions by the Mongol Empire. Uh, they were able to trap the Mongol forces on the beach, uh, where their close quarters fighting was superior due to the, the type of swords that uh, the Japanese used. Uh, in addition to this, the Mongol horse archers couldn't maneuver around because they were hemmed in on the beach. And secondly, uh, typhoon, a typhoon destroyed the fleet. And the Japanese saw this destruction of the Mongol fleet by uh, typhoon as the divine wind. They call it the kamikaze, uh, the divine wind, holy wind. This will have relevance for World War II. When we start to see another type of uh, divine wind, kamikaze, the special attack corps, uh, suicide pilots on, on suicide missions crashing into American warships. Uh, that's hearkening back to this period when uh, a typhoon destroyed much of the Mongol fleet and saved Japan from conquest by the Mongols. And the, J the Japanese were the only culture to soundly thrash the Mongols in that part of the world. 
uh, to prevent the Mongols from uh, uh, absorbing them into their empire. And the Mongols had conquered everyone from their point of view. They had conquered China, they had conquered Central Asia, they had conquered Korea, uh, uh, but the Japanese alone were able to uh, withstand them. And this gave the Japanese a sense of superiority, a sense of uniqueness, that, that this culture uh, was very unique. And, and you'll see this if you go to Japan today. There's a sense that, uh, for example, the Japanese government has claimed that only Japanese rice uh, can uh, uh, provide nutrition for the Japanese people. For the Japanese people, their biology is different. Uh, American rice, in particular, uh, South Carolina, Arkansas, etc., uh, that's, that, that's uh, unhealthy for the Japanese consumer, uh, from the Japanese government's argument. Of course, that's really just an argument to uh, protect native agricultural interests versus free trade, but uh, still, that's the argument that's used, and it works in that cultural context. Um, when I was in rural Japan, I uh, encountered uh, more than a few women who insisted that uh, Japanese women carried children in the womb uh, for ten months, not nine, uh, as is most common in the rest of the world. Now, I have no understanding as to why that might be, why they might think that. Is it something to do with the counting, or, or what? Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's something that people said. Uh, secondly, uh, in, in Japan, many people will say, uh, you know, we have four seasons in Japan. How many seasons do you have where you come from? And of course, in St. Louis, Illinois, uh, and then further north, uh, you have uh, four seasons, four distinct seasons. You don't have that in Mississippi, where I'm originally from. Uh, but uh, there are many places in the world where there are four distinct seasons. But from the Japanese mindset, the Japanese seasons are unique. And Japan is very unique. Um, it is an exceptional place filled with exceptional people. And that partly stems from isolation, but it also stems from this victory over this seemingly invincible. For much of their early history, the Japanese had been importing Confucianism as a philosophy, as a social philosophy, a philosophy of government, a philosophy of how to live your life, uh, but for spirituality, they were importing Buddhism from Korea and China, building Buddhist shrines, temples, etc. Uh, and Buddhism was replacing the, the native spirituality that, had, that was called Shinto, which was basically the worship of mountains, rivers, forests, all of the natural features of Japan. Well, after the Mongols were defeated, uh, Shinto began to re be revived. Uh, the Japanese began to look inward, to see what made them unique from China, unique from Korea, uh, as it was the Japanese nation that stood alone against the Mongols, and attributed their victory to their indigenous gods, in particular the goddess Amatras Kami. You see here, she is the sun goddess. She has these rays of light emanating from her head. Uh, she is the one who created Japan, created the Japanese race, and destroyed the uh, Mongol ships with a typhoon. So the system of government began to move away from the Chinese model. In the Chinese model, you can lose the mandate of heaven. If the emperor is, uh, uh, is wicked or inattentive or lazy, uh, heaven can forsake him and give the mandate of heaven to someone else. In the Japanese system, that's not possible. The, emperor's, the imperial family cannot be overthrown. The reason for this is that they are the descendants of the sun goddess, Amaterasu Kami, uh, and other deities. So the Japanese emperor is a god king. He's descended from the sun goddess, so he cannot be overthrown. In fact, if you look today, uh, the, the same family is still in power, the emperor Akito, Empress Michiko. Uh, if you search for them online, you can see pictures of them uh, uh, with various members of their family. Uh, and this family is still in control. The Yamato family is still in control and has been for uh, at least 1,500 years. It's the longest running uh, dynasty in the history of the world. So the emperors became these divine beings. Uh, they had always been acknowledged as such, but th the cult of the emperor began to grow and become more central uh, in society. Uh, but if an emperor is divine, you know, he can't be criticized, but also it's burdensome to bring with, to him these affairs of state. 
You know, he's a divine being. He shouldn't have to worry about the construction of roads, uh, the development of municipalities, uh, logistics, warfare, etc. Uh, so, uh, the emperor developed the role. Of the emperor developed into one of being a symbolic and religious figure, rather than an active one in government. The ultimate form of this is the shogunate. Shogun, the word shogun means army commander. And you can see the first shogun uh, from the 12th century pictured there, Minamoto Yoritomo. Uh, the shogun was a military dictator. He was a soldier, and you can see that by looking at the sword uh, at the side of Minamoto Yoritomo, signifying his status as a soldier. Uh, the shogun ascended to the office through military success, uh, and he took care of the affairs of state. And the idea was that he, quote unquote, freed the emperor from practical concerns. The shogun held the real power, day to day power, ruling in the name of the emperor. Underneath the shogun in the feudal system, we have what are called daimyo. And this means great landholder. These are the feudal lords. They live in castles, they have peasants under their command, they have their own knights called samurai, right? the samurai class, uh, the shogun, the daimyo, and other samurai all come from the samurai class, this class of noble warriors. Uh, and uh, they're military leaders in the very beginning, and then over time they develop uh, bureaucratic s skills. <clears throat> and during periods, these daimyo could be very rebellious, uh, small-scale fighting, intermittent warfare, very commonplace uh, during the 16th century especially. We'll talk more about that in a moment. We're going to talk about the samurai in general. Now the shoguns were samurai, the daimyo were samurai, always. But uh, the samurai uh, is a military aristocrat following the moral code of Bushido, or the way of the warrior. Uh, bushi uh, means just a soldier, a warrior, do, way. Uh, so the samurai sought to serve their daimyo, to do their lord's bidding, uh, even if it meant the loss of their, their lives. Uh, they upheld a very stringent code of honor. And you can see this in the, uh, reflected in uh, the behavior of people today. I'd like for you to go ahead and watch the second video, uh, Baseball Romance Scene. Uh, from a cartoon, a uh, very popular cartoon in Japan. I'd like for you to just go ahead and, and take a look at that. All right, so uh, you can see that it's very cheery, uh, it's very bright and, and wholesome. Uh, the reason for this, is this, this, uh, 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 th these two characters are considered heroes, and the reason for this is that the young man. Uh, has been beaten by his father, he has a shoulder injury, he's traumatized kind of psychologically as well as physically. Uh, but instead of complaining about uh, his injury and whether or not he can, can do what he needs to do in the game, uh, he kind of he gets it together, uh, he decides to face down this problem without complaining, without whining, without showing fear. <coughs> Similarly, the young lady in the cartoon uh, is dying from uh, uh, genetic illness. And rather than show fear, uh, uh, show her suffering, uh, complain, uh, show weakness, uh, she is providing for everyone there, helping to cook the lunch. Uh, uh, and of course, they have a little romance going between the two teenagers. Uh, but she is very nurturing, very caring for the group. Okay, so this idea of being optimistic, uh, 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 staring down your problems without complaining, without bitterness, without asking for help. This is this is called ginky, and it's a, it's a type of optimism. It's a type of, of staying positive, right? You want to stay positive. You don't want to uh, uh, ever show uh, uh, anything negative. Right? That this comes from samurai culture. This is part of the way of the warriors, part of Bushido. For example, uh, during sieges in which uh, samurai armies surrounded castles and attempted to starve the defenders out, 
uh, while they were starving to death, samurai would walk around in these castles picking their teeth with toothpicks as if they had just eaten. Right? This is a way of uh, stoically uh, uh, pushing their fear, uh, their pain and suffering deep down uh, and bearing it. You know, trying to bear it, to bear up to it. Just as these two characters have. Right? And it's something that carries on even today. So these samurai sought to be loyal to their masters and they lived in this honor-shame cultural context. Uh, if, if they were dishonored, uh, they would uh, often duel one another. Uh, if they were uh, dishonored enough, they could be ordered to commit seppuku, which is a type of ritualistic suicide, uh, and it basically it's uh, self-disembowelment. So uh, the middle sword, the uh, wakazashi uh, short sword, uh, they will uh, stick it into one uh, underneath their belly, on the right side, and they will, after thrusting it in, they will attempt to push it all the way around their torso uh, so that basically uh, their innards could fall out. And if they, if they move their arm, uh, their intestine and stomach would fall out. Uh, once they've done this, once they push the blade all the way across their torso and sh redeem themselves by showing that they've had like, literally the guts to do this, right? the bravery, the masculinity, the honor, uh, they... Uh, uh, a second, meaning a helper, uh, would, with a long sword, would be standing behind them and then uh, would end their suffering mercifully by taking their heads off. Uh, and there was a form of this for women samurai also. And, uh, samurai is a social class. So there are female samurai, there are 99-year-old samurai, there are 2-year-old samurai. If you're born into the samurai class, you're a samurai. Uh, and women were samurai. Uh, and their method of suicide involved uh, slitting, uh, slitting their throats. <clears throat> I'll just show you a couple of, of, of really cool pictures here. Uh, this is a photograph of samurai from the 19th century from the Satsuma clan. And, he, and when you look at this, uh, the man in the center, the leader, you look at the look on his face. Uh, you can tell he's a leader. You can tell his bravery. Uh, these men would be the men who modernized Japan. Uh, who brought it from kind of an isolated nation uh, uh, into a world power. And then there's a neat picture here of a demonstration in traditional samurai armor. That's lamellar armor. Uh, you have uh, iron plates, leather plates, uh, stitched together with uh, silk string in many instances, or on kind of a leather surface, uh, bolted in. So it's very effective at, pr at protecting uh, different parts of the body. There's another photograph from the 19th century of a samurai in armor posing with what's, with what's called a yard, which is just a long spear. And in most battles, the samurai would prefer to fight with a yari uh, and use their uh, sabers only in, uh, uh, as a second uh, a fallback. This is a samurai with a Buddhist death shroud, uh, and the reason that I include this is that and from this man's point of view, uh, he's already dead. Right? So uh, uh, he sees himself as dead. Uh, this is a sign of his being very willing uh, to throw his life away at any moment uh, if honor or the situation demands it. This is an image, a uh, photograph of a young man committing seppuku, around, I guess 18 or 19 by the look of uh, uh, his youth on his face. Uh, and you can see the second there ready to take his head off uh, as soon as he's able to push the blade all the way to the other side of his torso. And you can see the witnesses there uh, from the shogunate uh, with the swords. Peasants ranked underneath the samurai. This is about 90% of society or so. They had little to no political voice, and their overlords kill them for any reason whatsoever. So if you were a samurai and you were uh, you owned a village or two villages or three villages of peasants and you just were in a bad mood one day, you could walk into that village and you could disembowel or decapitate uh, anyone uh, without any repercussions. No fines, no having to explain yourself whatsoever. Uh, even furthermore, you could travel to the other side of the country to some lord's domain you don't even know 
and legally you could kill one of his peasants. Now he might have a problem with that because you're depriving him of income, of a laborer, so he might get after you uh, on, on that from that point of view, but uh, in terms of the rights of the peasants uh, themselves, uh, they had no right uh, 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 to live if, if, if the samurai decided otherwise. And this was written into the legal code. They're also bound to the land, so they can't move uh, from the land in which they're born into. So the estate they're born on is the estate they will have to work until they die, theoretically. Uh, and their children will be born onto the same estate, and so on and so on in per perpetuity. They were not allowed to carry arms, and for obvious reasons, uh, the samurai didn't like the idea of the peasants challenging them by having arms. Uh, and, of course, the peasants, in many instances, would hoard arms, collect arms, and would revolt against their samurai overlords. Uh, and the samurai were very fearful that they would lose uh, their position in society uh, if the peasants became armed uh, and effective. And we're going to talk about the Sengoku Jidai, or the age of war in the country. You can see this image of the battle of Kawanakajima here in 1561. You can see the cavalry, uh, the different samurai with Yari charging uh, each other. What happened was uh, the Ashikaga shogunate, the Ashikaga shogun, he lost authority in the 15th century. So the shogun lost authority, and you have all of these hundreds of independent daimyo, and they began to fight one another, fight one another for control, prestige, power, etc. It was during this period that, remember, the Portuguese and the Spanish are sailing all over the world at this point. Japan is one, places, one of the places they visit. And they brought with them their religion, Christianity, Catholic Christianity. And they also brought uh, tools and weapons and other pieces of technology. So they introduced firearms into the Civil War. And the Japanese, very efficient and reverse engineering these firearms, copying them, and manufacturing them themselves. In fact, by the end of this period, uh, Japan will be the world's leading producer of muskets. Uh, I'd like for you to take a look at the video uh, now uh, of the battle scene, Sengoku Jidai uh, battle scene, uh, in which you can see one daimyo, one warlord, charging an enemy warlord with his cavalry, uh, and that enemy meeting that cavalry charge with massed musket fire. So, if you wouldn't mind pausing this and taking a look at that. Okay, so you can see how lethal uh, firearms made these battlefields. And they revolutionized this type of warfare by adding to the carnage. Eventually, a daimyo named Tokugawa Ieyasu unified the country. He established a new bakafu, or shogunate, the Tokugawa shogun, shogunate. So you have all of these independent daimyo, and they owe their allegiance to Tokugawa. He's their overlord. He created what's called a system of alternating attendants. And this is how he controlled these daimyo. Uh, every other year, these daimyo had to reside in Edo, which is now Tokyo, the capital of the country. They had to reside there so that the shogun had strict control over them. Uh, every, uh, the, the other year, they, had, they, they returned to their estate. So year one, they were in their estate. Year two, they went to Edo. Year three, they were in their estate. Year four, they went to Edo. Year five, they were in their estate. And when they returned to their estates, their children would then arrive in Edo. So at, at, every, at every moment in time, the shogun had either the lords themselves or their heirs in his grasp, and he could execute them at will if there was a rebellion, treason, any sign of disloyalty. And this is how he kept control over these daimyo. And of course, uh, these processions of daimyo, they, they weren't, it weren't as, wasn't as though they were getting on a train by themselves with a backpack and, and arriving at Edo. We're talking about hundreds of people as part of these processions bodyguards, warriors, concubines, jugglers, uh, minstrels, uh, physicians, peasants, workers, etc. 
Tokugawa also forbade these daimyo from building new castles, because if they could build new castles, they could fortify themselves, and it would be very difficult to crush them. And it's important to point out, uh, this, is, this is something that happens many times throughout history, he outlawed firearms. One of the reasons for this is that with a few hours of training, a peasant could be taught to use a musket and could kill a samurai, a noble samurai, uh, who had been training for 25 years. Uh, so uh, there was a threat of class overthrow, of the peasants rising up and freeing themselves from feudal control. The samurai would lose control if there were all these guns floating around Japan, uh, because then the peasants would be able to defend themselves. This is the thinking of Tokugawa. Uh, so he outlawed firearms uh, in an attempt to preserve the feudal system. And this is something we see time and again, leaders attempting to outlaw firearms uh, as a way uh, of, uh, of assuming control or of maintaining a social system. Tokugawa also closed the country to all outside influence. He forbade any foreigners from coming into Japan. He expelled or executed all those foreigners inside Japan. If any foreigners were to arrive in Japan, he would sentence them to death. Furthermore, no Japanese were allowed to leave Japan. If you left Japan and landed, if you were on a fishing boat and you fell asleep and a storm came uh, and you landed in Korea, uh, you couldn't come back to Japan. If you came back, you would be executed for having visited a foreign country. He banned Christianity. Uh, he burnt or crucified large numbers of Catholic uh, Franciscan Jesuit priests and monks uh, and Christian con Japanese Christian converts. Uh, there was a period in which a significant portion of the country in the southernmost island, Kyushu, uh, converted to Christianity. Uh, and many of these Christians were killed uh, as he attempted to stamp Christianity out of the country. Uh, foreign trade was confined to a very small section of the port of Nagasaki, uh, and it was closely scrutinized by the government. So the Dutch, because they were willing to trade without spreading their religion, uh, the Dutch were allowed a very, 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 very tiny island uh, off the port of Nagasaki. Uh, about the size of uh, maybe uh, the North County campus, the entire uh, uh, territory, including the parking lot, so not very large at all, right, uh, for a handful of Dutch merchants uh, to maintain trade. And of course, nobody was allowed in to see them, except for prostitutes and uh, particular servants who uh, supplied them with their needs. Uh, but while this country was closed off to new ideas, and it was, it was in one sense very repressive, uh, there was a period of internal peace. The, it was uh, pacified uh, in that uh, the shogun had very tight control over society. And in this period of internal peace, during this period of internal peace, uh, Japanese culture began uh, to become ever more refined and unique. One sign of this is the ukiyo or floating worlds. The original model for a floating world was Yoshiwara in Edo or Tokyo. And these floating worlds were districts of cities where what uh, something called the Mizu Shobai or water trade uh, uh, went on. And this was basically uh, uh, it's, a, it's a euphemism for the sex trade. Uh, so you have prostitution. But, but you also have different arts involved with this. You have Kabuki theater in which there's a lot of uh, you know, great dramas are performed by actors. You have opera, you have music, poetry, puppet shows. Uh, people are, uh, great painters are collecting in uh, uh, izakayas uh, uh, to uh, taverns uh, to share their ideas. There are novelists, there are artists, uh, and of course there are geisha uh, who are not prostitutes. Uh, who are considered artists in their own right, uh, playing music, uh, charming uh, patrons, etc. Uh, and of course you, you have brothels as well. <coughs> and of course it's in these ukiyo, these floating worlds, where Japanese cuisine uh, is developed, uh, refined uh, further. 
And as I stated earlier, uh, uh, women born into the ranks of uh, samurai families, uh, they were also samurai, as you can see by this photograph of this young woman, uh, young samurai from the 19th century. Uh, you can see uh, on the right, you can see noble women uh, dueling with boken, which are wooden practice swords. <coughs> and of course, showing more examples of female samurai. Uh, for these next few slides, I'm going to show pictures with very little commentary, uh, just because they're kind of self-explanatory. And in many instances, the female samurai would be called on to defend the castles while the men were away on campaign. So uh, the martial arts they were taught kind of reflected this role. They were very defensive in orientation, uh, defending these fortresses from attack. And the different martial arts uh, that are uh, uh, that we'll just go into a little bit of discussion about. You won't need to know these for the test. Anything. There's kendo, the way of the sword. This is a picture of Miyamoto Musashi, a great philosopher and master swordsman, uh, winning I think it's around 200 duels. Uh, he eventually developed a swordsmanship style based on using two short two swords at once, the long sword and the short sword together in concert. There's also Kyudo, uh, the way of the bow, and while both sexes were taught this art, uh, uh, it was one of the uh, uh, women were required to focus on this because of its defensive role in defending castles. And it's also part of women's coming of age uh, ceremonies in different parts of Japan. If you wouldn't mind going ahead and looking at the video uh, on the uh, uh, women coming of age at the Sanju Sangendo uh, Temple uh, uh, in Kyoto uh, and the archery event. Okay, so you see this uh, uh, event. Uh, these women are uh, young girls. Are uh, they're becoming women? They're in very flowery kimonos uh, and they're practicing archery. It's a sign of their uh, becoming adults being able to defend uh, their homes, the homes of their families. Women were also encouraged in what's called naginata jutsu, or the use of the naginata, which is this pole arm here. It's basically a sword blade on, on a long pole. And this was thought to be uh, advantageous for women because its superior reach uh, enabled uh, uh, the warrior to overcome uh, differences in height. So you have the samurai, and then you have the peasants who are bound to the land. At the very bottom of society, you have what are called the barakumi, or hamlet people. They're also known as eta, which means an abundance of filth. This is the underclass. They were considered untouchables. They were uh, butchers, tanners, they hunt, handled the dead, they dug graves. Uh, and they had to wear special dress to separate themselves. They couldn't own land. They could not marry outside of the Barakami. So they were discriminated against, discriminated against in just about every way. They weren't allowed to use the same wells as regular people. Uh, they weren't allowed uh, to uh, uh, plant uh, crops. They weren't allowed to, they, they were seen as filthy and able to infect others. The Brachamine, on the very bottom of society, uh, like the peasants, just a notch above them in, in some respects, uh, found ways to fight against uh, uh, the system, the feudal system. And one of these is through Buddhism. Uh, there is a Buddhist sect called uh, True Pure Land, or Iko Iki. Uh, and you can see uh, a member of this sect called a Sohei, which, which is a term for a Buddhist warrior monk. You can see that he has a Nakinata. Uh, he's also a samurai, he's got the saber here, and he's wearing the same Buddhist shroud that we talked about earlier. The Iko Iki was a movement of Buddhists that was driven primarily by peasants and monks. And it called for the abolishment of social classes. Uh, and they, they were able to overthrow several daimyo. Uh, they were eventually defeated by the great warlord Oda, Oda Nobunaga, but these Buddhist monks and uh, this alliance of Buddhist monks and peasants put up quite a bit of, of resistance for a long time. 
of course, significant numbers of Barakami contribute to, the, to this rebellion due to the fact that uh, 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 it was seen as a way for them uh, to overcome uh, the, the, the low status that they had in the feudal system. Another way that peasants and Barakami uh, were able to uh, 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 raise their social status uh, and acquire wealth uh, was through crime. And we're going to look at the Yakuza, or the Japanese Mafia. A lot of Barakami, uh, Barakami families played a role in the Yakuza, just like in every society, people who are poor or who are on the bottom rung tend to gravitate towards uh, crime in some instances because uh, they're afforded very uh, little option uh, to participate in the mainstream. But, you know, these Yakuza were sponsored by different daimyo because uh, uh, they were criminals, but they were allowed to engage in some crime, the idea being that they would police the criminals, that they're criminals who police the other criminals. Uh, so they keep the crime confined into specific environments. Uh, they also can inform the daimyo about any spies that come through the province or any shady characters or whatever. This person here on the left is a female Yakuza, female gangster. Uh, you can see by what the, the pendant around her uh, neck that she is a Christian. Uh, she's a convert to Christianity in the 16th century. Uh, and you know, the, show, the Yakuza still exists today. Uh, what the Yakuza will do is they will, uh, 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 they will, they will exist in, in cities. They will run, uh, well, the, the adult entertainment industry is largely run by Yakuza. Uh, and they will uh, make sure that crime doesn't filter in into uh, uh, conventional neighborhoods. Uh, that the, the majority of the population is spared of the effects of crime. And of course the Yakuza are famous for these full body tattoos. Uh, that's one reason that in uh, Japan if you have tattoos, people will tend to look at you kind of askance uh, or skew. Due to the fact that in Japanese society, traditionally, and it's beginning to change a little bit, but not. But but the, the tradition still uh, plays a role. Uh, having a tattoo is a sign of being a gangster. Also, you know, if you ever find yourself in Japan or talking to a Japanese person, don't bring up the yakuza uh, because that kind of negativity uh, will turn the conversation very sour. Another way in which peasants, and in particular Barakumi, uh, could function within the system was as ninja and shinobi. Yes, the ninja were real. Uh, these were spies used to engage in assassination and subterfuge against the enemies of the daimyo. So the daimyo would hire these uh, Barakumi uh, as spies, as assassins, uh, as saboteurs, etc. And so traditions emerged in these Barakamine vi villages. Different forms of fighting, different types of weapons, ways to sneak around, ways to hide, different disguises, etc. One thing that the ninja often did is they would capture the enemy ba banners before battle and bring them back to their own ar the daimyo's camp uh, so that uh, uh, it would demoralize the enemy so they would be more easy, easy to defeat in the coming battle. They could also assassinate enemy generals, which would have a similar effect, causing confusion and a loss of morale in the enemy. And I'll just show an example of how ninja, uh, at least according to legend, could be successful. Uh, this is the daimyo Uesugi Kenshin. You can see that he's a devout Buddhist. He's wearing the Buddhist headdress we've talked about already. He suffered from stomach cancer. Uh, stomach cancer is much more common uh, in that part of the world than here. Uh, uh, interesting enough, breast cancer is almost unknown there uh, uh, relative to here. Uh, maybe that shows the role of diet in cancer. I don't know uh, anything about that, so uh, I won't comment. Uh, but uh, stomach cancer is much more common there than here. He was suffering from stomach cancer, uh, so he spent quite a bit of time on the privy, the toilet, uh, and a 
ninja, according to tradition, a ninja uh, sat in that toilet for three days, memorized what his rear end looked like, and when the moment was just right, he shoved a spear up through him and killed him. And of course, the ninja was trapped in the latrine, so he had to commit suicide uh, in all of that filth. And of course, the ninja, you know, they have the, the, the black suits that they're, they're famous for uh, 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 in movies, Hollywood. Uh, but most of the time, they wore a range of disguises to kind of blend in with the uh, ordinary people. So they would dress as, uh, if they were female, they would dress as prostitutes. Uh, they could dress as traveling musicians, as jesters, as actors. Uh, and you see over here that this Camuso monk, uh, where they wear a bamboo basket over their heads, these, this particular uh, sect of monks, uh, to kind of uh, uh, destroy their own identity. Uh, this was a perfect disguise for ninja because it, it, it provided them the way uh, to uh, mask themselves. And of course, it's very taboo, sacrilegious to take the basket off of one of these monks. So the authorities were less inclined uh, to test uh, these people and see if they were back ninjas or wanted criminals. And these traditions still exist. For example, you see in this picture, Janichi Kawakami is the last grandmaster of the Koka Ninja clan. He actually teaches a class on quote-unquote ninja studies at a university in Japan. That class would be really fun to take, I think. And I'll just show this picture here, just for entertainment. This is a cabinet of different uh, uh, good uh, uh, objects I've acquired throughout the years. Uh, this is a message uh, uh, that a professor of mine uh, gave me, this is written in Mandarin Chinese script. Uh, this is up here in the top, it's called a uh, no mask, it's a type of theater. Uh, the mask is of a kind of vengeful warrior, he's, uh, he's angry about the death of his lord and he's striving to uh, uh, avenge his lord and is driving him mad, that's a character typical in those kinds of plays. And you can see these cups down here in the middle rack. Uh, those are called uh, uh, takoyaki, and it's a very special uh, type of pottery produced in the Kyushu region. Uh, it's very valuable, very prized. And of course, you see the swords up here. And I put my oldest son there holding the sword, kind of being muggy, just because I thought it was funny. Uh, and the swords are, uh, they're not sharp. They're ceremonial swords, uh, decorative. Uh, so there's zero chance of him cutting himself or hurting himself, so don't worry about that. Very, it's, it, it's not sharp at all. Uh, so I just let him hold it for a second while I was there while I took this picture. And then he got mad because I took it away from him. But uh, you can see uh, uh, that there. I'm fascinated by that stuff. Okay, so uh, that's it for this lecture. And remember, if you have any questions at all, uh, please let me know.